And maybe it's clear to some of you that this is going to be relevant to differential equations, and maybe it doesn't seem obvious to others, but suppose I have the following equa differential equation. If I have y double prime, I'll put an s on here, plus y prime, plus y, or minus y, not minus y, equals zero. Suppose that that was our um, equation. And this is a constant coefficient linear differential equation. It's linear in all the power in all the terms in y or y derivatives of y. And so that kind of solution is going to be of this form. y is equal to a e to the lambda x. We substitute that into the equation. What we get is epsilon lambda squared times a e to the lambda x plus lambda a e to the lambda x minus a e to the lambda x equals zero. And all these terms now, they cancel, right? The a e to the lambda x. And what we're left with is epsilon lambda squared plus lambda minus one equals zero. And so we get back this um, quadratic equation that we just finished analyzing using um, the perturbation expansions, right? The regular and singular perturbation expansions. So you can probably guess already that there's going to be a close connection between the perturbation methods that I showed for the quadratic equation and differential equations. Okay, so now let's do an actual boundary value problem. So let's get rid of this equation and the problem. All right, now we're going to continue these perturbation uh, methods, but in the context of a differential equation. And the first problem we'll, we'll look at is going to be um, this problem. Y double primed of x plus epsilon y primed of x is equal to 1. That's a differential equation subject to the boundary conditions y of 0 equals 0 and y of 1 equals to 2. So it's a boundary value problem. We have an equation which has to be uh, satisfied and we have two conditions at the boundaries. And we need two boundary conditions because this is a second order differential equation. When we integrate it twice, we'll get two integration constants. And so we'll be able to satisfy these two boundary conditions. And what we're gonna look for in P4 is a solution in powers of the small parameter epsilon. So we're gonna try a solution of this form. Y of X is equal to Y naught of X plus epsilon y1 of x plus epsilon squared y2 of x plus and so on. And as before, we will substitute into the equation and derive uh, and then equate all the like powers of epsilon and make sure that the equation is satisfied at every order in epsilon, just like we did for the algebraic problem. So at order epsilon, uh, well, first we'll substitute in. So if we substitute in, we get y naught double prime plus epsilon y1 double prime plus epsilon squared y2 double prime plus etc plus epsilon y naught prime plus epsilon y1 prime plus epsilon squared y2 prime plus dot 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 minus one equals zero. That's the equation. And then the boundary condition will be y naught of zero plus epsilon y1 of zero plus epsilon squared y2 of zero plus dot 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 equals zero. That's the first boundary condition. And then the other one is y1, sorry, y0 of one plus epsilon y1 of one plus epsilon squared y2 of one plus dot 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 equals two. All right, and then now we collect the like powers of epsilon. So collecting the powers of uh, the terms that involve a epsilon to the power zero, what we get. So in the first term, we get y naught double prime, nothing in this one, minus one equals zero. And then we get the boundary conditions, which is y naught of zero equals zero, and y naught of one equals zero. All right, so this is the problem at epsilon equals zero. Then we can do the same thing, collecting terms for epsilon to the power one we get uh, y1 double prime plus y naught prime equals zero, subject to uh, y1 of zero equals zero, and y1 of one equals zero. And we can keep going in principle. 
we have uh, to the power epsilon squared. What we have in the first term is y2 double primed plus y1 primed equals zero. And then the boundary condition, y2 of zero equals zero and y2 of one equals zero. Okay, so let's uh, solve the equation. So let's solve this problem. So this equation, if y naught double prime is equal to one, then y naught prime is equal to x plus a constant. And then if I integrate again, I get a half x squared plus a constant times x plus another constant. So the solution is y naught is equal to one half x squared plus the first constant times x plus c1 plus the second constant c2 times just c2. Right, we integrate it twice. And to find out what c1 and c2 are, we apply the boundary condition. So applying x equals zero, so y of zero equals zero implies that c2 equals zero. So y zero of zero equals zero implies that c2 is equal to zero. Whereas y zero of one equals two, well, that should be two, right? That should be a two here, right? So we have to equal to two. Uh, this term doesn't involve a power of epsilon and this one doesn't involve a power of epsilon. So that is a two, that's important. Whereas the other ones are zero, those are correct because uh, there is no term uh, involving powers of epsilon on the right-hand side. All right, so if y one is equal to two, y naught of one is equal to two, that means that one half plus c1, one half plus c1 is equal to two, or c1 is equal to three halves. And so my first uh, function, y naught of x, is equal, equal to one half x squared plus three halves x. And we solve for y naught. And we have a solution that satisfies the equation to order at epsilon to the power zero, to order one, I guess, and the boundary conditions. Then we go to the next order. And now uh, y1 double prime is equal to minus y naught primed. And we integrate once. So we get y1 prime is equal to minus y naught plus a constant d1. And then we can integrate again. But first we'll substitute in what y naught is since we know what it is. So we can do the integral. We get a half x squared plus three halves x plus d1. And that's y1 prime. Now that means that y1 of x is equal to the integral of that. So this will be one over six x cubed plus three over four x squared plus d1 times x plus d2. And then we apply the boundary condition. So if at x equals zero, the solution has to vanish, so that means d2 equals zero. So y1 of zero equals zero implies that d2 is equal to zero. Whereas y1 of one equals zero implies that one sixth plus three quarters plus d1 equals zero. Or d1 is equal to um, uh, minus one six plus three quarters. So the common denominator uh, is 12. So it's two plus uh, nine is 11. So it's minus 11 over 12. So then I know y one of x is equal to, uh, here it is, one sixth x cubed plus three quarters x squared minus 11 over 12. And we can keep going. I could, in principle, solve this one. I'm not going to do it, but one could do it and keep integrating. And then we then have the solution, right? If I plug in here, what I have is I found that y naught is a half x squared plus 3 halves x. That's the first term. Plus epsilon times y1 which is one sixth x cubed plus three quarters x squared minus 11 over 12. Plus, assuming I didn't make any algebraic errors, which I very, may very well have. 
But you can see the mechanics of how we would go on and then we can solve this problem and we can work our way forward. And all the problems are easy to solve because once we've already um, uh, solved for the, if I solve for y naught, then for y1 it's just a matter of doing two integrals in a row. And they're always simple integrals involving um, polynomials, so they're all easy to integrate. And we can march forward forever and get all the orders. So this is an example of a regular perturbation theory to solve a boundary value problem. All right, so this one, everything worked out nicely. We can satisfy all the boundary conditions. I did it so that we can contrast the next problem I'm about to do where um, this is not going to work so simply.